Please sit down. I thank you very much. And uh, I, too, am uh, awed in the presence of Walter Isaacson. Um, and uh, I have been since uh, we both were kids. <laughs> um, and uh, by, by the way, he is one of the great authors, one of the great writers, and, uh, and also has a, uh, which will ruin his reputation, uh, he has a heart as big as his head, and it matters, and I appreciate it. No, it's important. At least it's important to this Biden. Um, look, it's great to be here and during the important work of this summit. Uh, you look around the world today, and we're reminded, uh, and it sounds, uh, it sounds kind of nativist almost to say, you look around the world and remind it what a, what, what a special country this country is. I mean, it really is. It's a special country. We embrace liberty. We stand up for freedom. We understand, at least the vast majority of us, everyone in this room, I hope, understands that our great strength lies in our diversity. It's not our weakness. It's our strength. And it really is. A guy Waller knew before he died was a man named Lee Kuan Yew, who was the uh, brilliant, brilliant, uh, somewhat autocratic at the time, a president of Singapore. I was coming, Walter, from, uh, from Mumbai to head to Beijing by way of, uh, of Tokyo, and I got a call, would I stop in Singapore and see him? He was then 91 years old, a couple, maybe five, six months before he died. And uh, he wanted to see me because he knew I knew, or at least had spent more time with Li Kuan Yew, uh, excuse me, more time with uh, President Xi of China, than any other world leader. Just it's a happenstance, I won't explain why, but I've spent a lot of time with him. And he wanted to talk about it. He's written, he wrote extensively on the future of China, Russia, India, and the United States. He was, uh, he had great insights. And so we were talking, uh, Walter, about how uh, she had um, uh, consolidated power so quickly, to my surprise anyway, and somewhat to his. And I turned to him and I said, what is the, uh, what, what are the Chinese doing now, Mr. President, speaking to Lee Kuan Yew? And he looked at me, he was very frail physically, but his mind was, as my mother would say, sharp as a tack. And he said, oh, Mr. Biden, he speaks perfect English. He, matter of fact, speaking the autocratic part of him, he insisted that everyone in China was, as, as, excuse me, everyone in Singapore is ethnically Chinese, primarily, that the official language would become English. Everyone had to speak English. And to make a long story short, uh, he looked at me in perfect English, and he said, the Chinese, Mr. Vice President, are in the United States looking for the buried black box. And I had the same expression in my face you all have. <laughs> this is about the time the airliner went down off of Malaysia. Remember, this is about eight months after that. And I said, I beg your pardon, Mr. President, I'm not sure what you mean. He said, they're looking for the box buried in America that contains the secret that tells why America is the only nation in the world that's constantly able to remake itself. Constantly able to remake itself. And I said, uh, Mr. President, I'm getting old enough now to presume to venture a guess what they'll find in that box. I said, there's two things. First, they'll find an unrelenting stream of immigration in significant waves since 1735 on, with occasional xenophobic response, but always ultimately, not, not in dribs and drabs, in major waves. And I said, that's given us an enormous advantage because we've been able to cherry pick the most capable people of every culture. For your parents and my great-grandparents to make a decision to come to this country, it took enormous courage. It took a sense of optimism. It took uh, almost an inherent entrepreneur instinct to do it. And I really mean this. So we've been able to get the best, the best of every culture in the world. And I said, there's a second thing they'll find in that black box. Stamped into the DNA of every American naturalized or native born 
is an overwhelming skepticism for orthodoxy. Seriously, think about it now. Those of you who are Anglophiles and Francophiles, very proud of the heritage they represent, but there's no other place in the world where a kid in first grade or third grade or seventh grade, no matter how poor the school is in America, can challenge orthodoxy and be unchallenged in their challenge. That's why we're so innovative. So when I say, and it relates to the larger subject that I'm here to speak about, when I say that this is a special place, it's a special place because of, not in spite of, because of, and this, this is not a political statement, it's a, I think, historical fact, because of our diversity is the reason why we are who we are. What makes America is that everyone in this nation believes, at least did, and everyone seeking refuge in this nation believes this is a place where you have opportunity, where there's an opportunity to succeed. That's all of us. I mean all of us. We're all viewed to be dealt into the deal. At our core, we've always believed that what sets America apart from every other nation on earth is a single word. I was in Chengdu with President Xi. He asked me in one of our private dinners, Walter, he said, can you define America for me? And it was a literal question. And I said, yes, I can, Mr. President, one word. I mean, he was vice president then. Mr. Vice President, one word, possibilities. Think about it. What other word better describes the United States of America? in the eyes of the rest of the world, and up until recently, in the eyes of the vast majority of the American people, including in the Delta, possibilities that anything is possible. Possibilities for a kid growing up poor in the Delta or in inner city Washington or Wilmington, Delaware, in a Spanish-speaking home in LA, or in a subdivision called Mayfield in Wilmington, Delaware, where I did to be anything, do anything you want it to be. That's how I grew up, for real. Not, it's not hyperbole, that's how I grew up. Being taught I could be anything I wanted to be, without exception. Neither of my parents college educated. We weren't poor, we were, I guess we were technically lower middle class economically, but we never viewed it that way. It's what the president grew up believing. That's what I'm sure many of, you up, many of you grew up believing as well. It's always been true in this country. And if we ever lose that, then we will have lost something incredibly special and consequential here in the United States. We will have lost the soul of the country. And I would argue we're in danger of losing it now. That's why I'm here. That's why what all of you have been discussing, I believe, is so important. Now, let me tell you a story. About a year or so ago, I was meeting with one of the most important and prominent pollsters in the country who came in to discuss with me because, you know, I'm referred to, as Walter can tell you by, some of you know, by the press as middle class Joe. In Washington, that is not meant as a compliment. It means if you're middle class, you're not sophisticated because everybody's sophisticated in Washington. <laughs> you think I'm kidding, I'm not. <laughs> Walter knows I mean it. If I carry a little chip on my shoulder still from Scranton and Claymont, I do. But look, this pollster, who I'll confide in you privately when uh, I finish here, told me, and this is the God's truth, because my, uh, one of the best political minds in the country, in my view, is Mike Donlan, who was working for me. Mike was with me in the room. And he said, Mr. Vice President, you have to understand, the middle class doesn't believe today what you grew up in your generation believing in the post-World War II generation. They don't want to buy a house anymore. They're not sure about college. Over, and he cited a number at the time, 52% middle class family said college wasn't worth it for their children. He said, it's different now. 
They're down, remember the phrase, they're downsizing their dreams. In fact, he told me, we shouldn't even, and I should stop using the phrase middle class. We should not use the phrase middle class anymore. So when the meeting ended, I turned to Mike. I, I thanked him for his advice and the presentation because he had statistical data to show that there are more middle class folks saying I don't want to buy a home and I now want to send my kid to college and I don't want to get a mortgage, et cetera. As he walked out the door, I looked at Mike and I said, you know, there's a guy who understands everything and knows nothing. <laughs> no, no, I, I wasn't being critical. It's nonsense. That's what the answer to the questions concluded. But that didn't reveal at all what's still in the heart of every American out there. I don't buy it. I don't buy once for one single moment that the aspirations of the people of this country have changed. Our hopes and dreams are really stamped into our DNA. Don't tell me people would rather rent than buy a home. Don't tell me that a parent wouldn't do anything. I've, have you ever been from a barrio to an upscale neighborhood where you met a mother who didn't want their child to go to college? Have you met them? I have not met them, and I've been around more than any one of you. <laughs> now, by the way, if you want to learn the country, run for president twice. <laughs> well... I didn't run for the third because I know I know the country now. But. <laughs> Look, I'm serious. Parents would break their back to raise their kid in a safe neighborhood. They know one of the things that, you know, one of the things that made me the angriest, and you may remember, Walter, for real, I was in a, in a really fine guy, and he really is a fine guy. The new speaker is a genuinely fine guy. I can now say, without hurting him, I called and encouraged him to take the job because I think he's decent, I think he's honorable. But one of the things that bothered me, in, no, 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 one of the things that bothered me in the last campaign was the way, and, and Romney is a fine man. I mean, he really is a genuinely fine man. I, I'm not being solicitous, I mean what I say. No one ever doubts I mean what I say. The problem is I sometimes say all that I mean. Um, but I remember a comment being made when Romney talked about the 40 percent and when the vice presidential candidate said I worked and I think it was a McDonald's and I flipped hamburgers and I had dreams. As if guys like me growing up in Claymont didn't have dreams. As if the Hispanic kid flipping a hamburger next to him didn't have the same damn dreams. As if somehow, no, I really mean it. As if somehow you ha only those who have real opportunity have dreams. Well, look, I got news for everybody. Those dreams are real. When I got in office with the president, Walter, and I asked the president, I suggested we set up a middle class task force at the beginning because there was no legislative change we could make to what could we do in every division to make life a little more easy for the middle class and working class going through this recession. And, um, and I remember I had some very good economists work for me, I still do. Like Jared was there, I mean, really super bright Economists, and I remember when I used the term, they said, "Well, that's fifty-one thousand two hundred dollars." Another one said, "No, it's fifty-three thousand dollars." Middle class is not a number, guys. Middle class is an aspiration. It, it, it is an ideal, an idea. To me, middle class means being able to own your home someday and not just rent it. Being able to send your kid to a park where you're confident that they're likely to come home safely. Being able to send them to a local high school where you know if they do well enough, they can get to college. And if they get there, you can find a way to afford to get them there. And when dad dies, you can take mom in and hope your children never have to take care of you. That's middle class. 
That's middle class from the dreams in the Delta to middle class neighborhoods like I grew up in, and all of you did probably. It's what beats in the heart, I think, of every American. It's the belief that there's nothing they can't do, the possibilities that if you're willing to work hard enough, anything's possible. So here's where the pollster got wrong. What's in the hearts of America haven't changed a bit. What has changed are the rules of the game. There used to be a basic bargain in America, and I mean this sincerely. It was accepted by Republicans and Democrats where we disagreed on the margins, but we accepted the basic bargain, and it was this. If you contributed to the success and profitability of an enterprise, you got to be part, you got to share in the benefits. You helped, you were able to enjoy some of the prosperity you created. But today that bargain is broken. The link between success of a business and wages paid to workers has evaporated. Considered over the past 40 years, productivity has gone up 72%. Wages have increased 9%. Now I realize that globalization automation has had an impact on that. So you're replaced by a robot. Globalization has changed the competitive env environment we're in. But it doesn't explain the overall trend of nearly four decades in uh, being rooted, in my view, in what we don't want to talk about. Unfair tax policy and unfair fiscal policy. Short-sightedness on the part of not only corporate America, but business generally. A failure to invest in our nation's greatest asset, our people. For too long, our tax code has been stacked against American workers. And by the way, I really do love Bernie Sanders. I'm not being a wise guy. I love him, and I think he's making a very important generic point to make. But I'm not Bernie. I'm not, I, 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 I don't think all our problems relate to 516 billionaires in the country. And I don't think that wealthy folks are, as I've said, and I really mean it, the wealthy are just as patriotic as poor. So this is not about bashing the wealthy or punishing. But we're in the midst of a long-term decline in the progressivity of our tax code and a lot of other things. The top, those at the top pay less and less, in fact. By the way, you know, we talk about our friends on the right, talk about social engineering, and, and we're, we're, we're trying to, all the progressivity has been up. It's been up. It hasn't been down. It's been up. And we need to change it. There's no, there's no real justification to state the obvious and easy saw that you hear all the time for a hedge fund manager paying a lower tax rate than the secretary. I mean, it really is just kind of bizarre. Now, granted, it will not solve the problem, but it's in the order of about another $25 billion, I think, in revenue if we, they paid the rate they should. There's no reason for what we call stepped-up basis. I, I, look, when Ronald Reagan was president, there were about $600 billion in, uh, in um, uh, tax expenditures, meaning exemptions from having to pay a tax, like your mortgage deduction. That's one obvious one everybody knows. There were $600 billion of those written into the tax code. Today, on a yearly basis, there is about a trillion, 200 billion written in the tax code. Some are very worthwhile. But I challenge you to find more than 500 billion of that that has any social redeeming value or in any way is increasing productivity. It's designed, a lot of this is designed to increase productivity, investment, et cetera. So, if you take a look at it, you go back and you see that uh, the deck has been stacked. And uh, in the midst of a long-run decline in progressi progressivity, the bottom line is those at the very top are paying a lot less. And we have this income disparity that hasn't existed since 1921-22, where the top 1% control somewhere about 24% of all the income in America. Not control, earn. 
of, of, of all the income in America. And again, these aren't bad guys. It's the way we've changed the system. The capitalist system works. It provides incentives. We've got a lot of bad incentives in the system right now. For example, there's no reason why we should tax unearned income at such a disproportionately lower rate than we tax earned income. No, I mean, for real, it's not. I started to say to you, there's, you know, one of those loopholes is what they call stepped up basis. Stepped up basis is simple. If you are in a family where mom or dad are wealthy enough, say, to buy a million dollars worth of stock, and over a five-year period or whatever the period of time is, it, it, it increases the value to, to, uh, to five million, and they sell it, they pay the tech capital gains between one and five. But if dad dies before he, in fact, pays that tax and leaves it to you, his daughter, and you hold it for five years, it's now worth 10 million, you only pay the difference between 5 million and 10 million. That's $14 billion a year that goes uncollected. That's, there's no rational reason why it should. There's a number of these things in the code. So why is an investor more important than a worker? I have a cartoon my staff hates me having. They keep hiding it, Walter. I always put it in the mantle, and they come. They're, they're more politically correct, and they put it behind a picture of my mother and the president. And, uh, <laughs> and it's a picture you may have seen in The New Yorker, a cartoon, of a big rotund guy in a black shirt with a black beret with a, with a, um, you know, a mask on. And he's sitting at a table, and there's this big bag in front of him marked money. And he's looking at the cop, and he's saying, how was I to know he was a job creator? <laughs> How was I to know he's a job creator? How did we get to the point where we think that investors are the only job creators? My dad ran an automobile agency. He created a hell of a lot of jobs selling those General Motors automobiles. He kept a hell of a lot of people working on the assembly line and in the dealership he ran. And the woman who worked as the waitress in the diner down the corner. But fair taxes aren't just about tax bills. They help raise wages even before taxes are paid. Part of the reason corporate pay has exploded relative to wages has been that executives are paying less of a tax on their compensation. For example, if you're paying, I'm going to exaggerate, if you're paying 70%, no one does, highest is 38. If you're paying 38% on the increase in wage you get, you have less incentive to go out and try to get a bigger piece of the soft, smaller pie than if you're paying an effective rate of 14%. You're much more encouraged to go get a bigger slice of the pie, but you're paying less taxes and your income will increase exponentially. And so what's happened is, you know, when Reagan was president, President Reagan was president, um, uh, I believe the number was out, the average employee of a Fortune 500 company, uh, the CEO made somewhere around 38 per times as much as the average employee. Now it's close between 350 and 400 times as much. What happened, guys? I mean, really, I mean, what is it that happened? What happened to justify that? One of the things I found out, Walter, putting together a jobs program for the president, is we're out spending a lot of money training workers. Why in the hell aren't corporations training the workers? We always hear, corporations, what do they say? We need more workers. When DuPont, DuPont bought Conoco, when I was a senator from Delaware, they spent a lot of money retraining workers. Well, look, folks, we, we got the incentives all wrong. Let, let, let me tell you what I call short-termism. That's when a CEO are paid uh, for short-term movements in the company's stock prices instead of long-term investments in the company. 449 companies in the S&P 500 invested 90, and by the way, they made from 2003 to 2013 about $3 trillion, $600 billion. It's a good thing. It's a good thing for America. 
But they spent 54% of that profit buying back their own stock, which they weren't allowed to do before the SEC changed it during the Reagan administration. And they spent 37% for the job creators, the investors, leaving 9%, 9% of all the profits for research, development, employee training, and buying equipment. So the reason why they're looking for taxpayers to train their workers. Now, all of this, you know, Samuel Clemens once said, you know, all generalizations are false, including this one. <laughs> so there are exceptions, but I'm trying in the in interest of time and sort of try to lay out what I honestly believe has taken place. And so all these things that help long-term health of a company and prosperity are being put on the back burner. Now, again, you'll hear uh, folks in the other team say, well, there's a reason for that. There's not enough growth in the world economy. There's not enough to invest in. This is the way we get people to invest more, et cetera. Well, you know, while, uh, while policy changes are important, fair tax rules, uh, smart incentives, uh, investing in workers, they aren't enough. We have to change the mindset in the country, in my view. Some 30 years ago, uh, a new idea entered the corporate world, and I really mean this. And that is, that's when, even before that, when I was in law school, we were talked about the fiduciary responsibility corporate executives have to their shareholders, but they also used to teach there's responsibility to the community and responsibility to their workers. But about 30 years ago, it started to creep in that the only responsibility, and as my wife, who was a professor, would say, Google it, you'll see what I'm saying, is that the only responsibility was to shareholders, not to workers, not to the community, not to the nation. Maximizing shareholder value, maximizing it was the objective. Well, frankly, from the moment that notion took hold, we began to go off the rails. Just look at the facts. This nation's economy has always been strongest and grown the most and the fastest when the rewards of an enterprise were fairly shared. And our economy is struggle when all the rewards went to just a narrow few. Now look, I'm not, again, I'm not here to bash the wealthy. I'm not here to bash the banks. And I've long said, as I already repeated, that the wealthy are as patriotic as the poor. But I've, the fact of the matter is that I'm here to make an appeal to corporate and business leaders in this nation to meet their responsibilities to the nation. Business does have a responsibility to workers. Business does have a responsibility to the community. Business does have responsibility to the nation. Because, in fact, when they don't meet that responsibility, all of those three sectors are weaker, and they, in turn, end up weaker. We need to return to a mindset that helped create the mightiest economic engine in the face of the earth. Not only it's not only in the best interest of the workers in the nation, frankly, it's also in the long-term interest of the business community. Over time, their enterprises will do better, and maybe most important, it's in the interest of the social stability of the nation. We can't sustain the current level of inequity in this country. It's just not possible. Lest we forget it, let me say it as clear as I can. The middle class is the reason we have the social stability we have in this country. It's the reason for America's social and political stability. While other countries going through very difficult times have had a much harder run for it than we have, it's been this notion, this notion that a middle class was accessible, if you were in it, it was growing, and the possibilities persisted. If we continue down the path toward the destruction of the middle class, I think we're in very dangerous territory. We've always been strongest when we've been one America. You look, when I say that, people think I'm talking about ending the poisonous division, tearing this country apart. That's true. It is there, but that's not what I'm talking about. Or they think I'm talking about our commitment to equal rights and civil rights and human rights. That's also true. But I'm also talking about something else. I'm talking about fairness and opportunity. I'm talking about making an economic promise that this nation, in fact, held out. I'm talking about an economy that works for all people. 
And by the way, it's, it's, it's not just Joe Biden or some progressive think tank saying this. The Fed recently laid out one of the greatest dangers to growth is concentration of wealth. Standard and Poor's wrote a report uh, four months ago now. One of the greatest threats to economic growth is concentration of wealth. The IMS, the IMF is warning that income inequity diminishes economic growth for everyone. It's about growing the economic pie, not shrinking it. Up to now, the last 20 years, the debate about the pie is here, who gets the biggest piece? What most powerful interest gets the biggest piece? Instead of what it was the previous 60 years of how do you grow the pie? Everybody does better. We can't continue on this path where a few people get rich in a, a disproportionate share of the rewards of the economy. It's neither healthy nor is it economically sustainable. The middle class has to be dealt back in. Otherwise, the delta has no chance. None. Zero. Look what happens when the middle class starts to shrink. People sitting around their kitchen tables don't want to hear from Joe Biden about the poor. They want to know how they're going to, who's going to tell Mary she can't go back to the university next semester. John, you're going to have to drive on those tires another 20,000 miles. We can't afford to change them now. They're the conversations going on in kitchen tables all around America. And when that conversation is going on, although they believe it, they don't want to talk about Miss Hattie in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. They know she has a problem. Think of every single solitary program that affects and benefits the poor and those in need. It's there because it's sustained by the support of the middle class. That's how it's sustained. Look. The nation works best when it works for the middle class because when the middle class does well, folks above them do very, very well, and the poor have a ladder. And the one thing you can't deny, an American or anyone, is hope. You deny them hope, you've robbed them of something very, very, very valuable. And so as I look at this, it seems to me that there are certain things that we can do that can begin to change the dynamic here. We've done it before, and it's totally within our wheelhouse. You know, um, uh, if you give people a fair shot and give them a chance to fulfill their potential, I can't think of any time in American history they've ever let the country down. I, I, I can't think of a time that that's occurred. And so we can start, for example, by raising the minimum wage. It's not going to solve the problem. But if we raise the minimum wage across the country to $12 an hour, that, uh, that would raise wages for 35 million people in America, millions of whom are living on the edge right now. Since we made that call, cities and states have stepped up. I was out with, uh, I had the honor of being with uh, Eric Garcetti, a good friend, the mayor of Los Angeles, when he announced that uh, the city council moved to increase the minimum wage, $15 an hour. I went up with my buddy Andrew, uh, with Governor Cuomo, when he announced a uh, $15 an hour minimum wage for fast food workers across the state and now is attempting to implement it for the entire state. I know business communities always howl at uh, uh, how much, how many jobs uh, this will cost. But folks, the facts don't back up their assertions. And for me, this is simple. If someone is working 40 hours a week, they shouldn't be living in poverty in this country. No, no, it's really, it's not a, I, I, you know, I know we say that all the time. But you understand what this a, a raise to $12 an hour does. It lifts hundreds of thousands of people out of poverty. It matters. It's not the whole answer to inequity by any stretch of the imagination, but it's an important start job training. Our people have to have the skills to succeed in a new economy. 
One of Marco Rubio, one of the candidates, biggest applause lines in a recent debate was how we need more welders than philosophers. No offense to philosophers, but, uh, and we need them badly. I don't think they think we need them at all, but we need them. <laughs> but Marco, welcome to the team. Well, we've known all along. We need more welders. We need more folks. I led the task force for the president on this, and let me tell you, there are a few more powerful things to see than someone who's been out of a job or has lost all hope of getting trained to take a job get that opportunity. It's life-changing. We need 1,100,000 IT workers just by the year 2022. I was up in Michigan. There's an, there, there's, there's an outfit that places IT workers called IT International. I, I think that's the name of it. And they place workers across the country. Turned out they realized with the exodus from Detroit, now that Detroit's getting off its back and onto its feet, all of a sudden, they found they need a 1,000 programmers they didn't have. So they came in with the community college we helped it set up, and they put together a program. I went in, and they went in, and I think it was, 50, don't hold me, I think it was 54 women, all from the hood, from the neighborhood. Not one woman had more than a high school degree. Most had GEDs. They ranged in age from 24 to 58. After 14 weeks, every one of them had a job. The lowest starting salary, $56,000. The highest starting salary, $102,000. It's all about teaching people how to program and code. We need another 67,000 registered nurses. They make $65,000, $70,000. I could go down the list. I won't bore you anymore. But we can do this. Obamacare. We need to protect the 17 million people that now are insured who otherwise weren't. Republicans are still determined to repeal it, but it's also an economic issue, not just a health issue. For folks who are just getting by, who are just one illness from financial ruin, few things are more important than health insurance that they can depend on. Well, I keep telling the president what he did beyond providing health care, he restored peace of mind for millions of people. Some of you were raised in a family where I was raised in, where I'm sure my dad went to bed staring at the ceiling thinking, if one thing happens, I lose the house. If one thing happens, I lose. Peace of mind matters. And just a reminder, folks, in your communities, they can still sign up. We have an open enrollment period. It's healthcare.gov by December 15th of 2015 for coverage that starts in 2016. Little advertisement. <laughs> but we have to do a lot more. We, we have to level the playing field, and it's going to take access to education and opportunity to work. Does anybody here, I mean, I, I wonder what your kids will think, or your grandkids, in the next uh, 20 to 50 years, if they realized there was a debate about whether or not 12 years of free public education was enough in the 21st century. I mean, think about it. The thing that allowed us to be the economic juggernaut that we were beginning in the late 1800s was that we were the only major country in the world that provided 12 years of free education to everybody and anybody. The rest of the world caught up. So we know 12 years isn't enough now. Now I know when I talk about 16 years, the president went with 12, and he, uh, he supports the 16-year proposal, but let's see if we can get done. But, you know, if you think about it, well, what do you hear? Well, there go those, you know, those big spending Democrats again, those deficit spenders. My wife is a full-time professor, says any country that out-educates us will out-compete us. So it makes sense that we increase educational opportunity well beyond high school, because we know six out of 10 jobs right now requires more than a high school degree. But here's the deal. We can pay for it. We can pay for that, and we can pay for child, child care, one of the biggest barriers to working women in the workplace. Well-qualified working. We need to triple the child care tax credit. That alone will lead to a dramatic increase in women in the workforce, in turn, increase the GDP, and it benefits everyone. And here's how we pay 
those two things. You can pay for all of that. By one change, it doesn't punish the wealthy. It says just get the game with us. If we limited deductions to 28 percent, that would pay for every single solitary person in a four-year public university free, and it would pay for tripling, tripling the tax credit, allowing women to get back to work. I love my Republican friends who talk about, you know, particularly women, they really don't have much economic sense. No, seriously, you hear that debate about, you know, well, let, let me tell you, they have a lot of economic sense. If you have two kids and you have an opportunity to make a job making $24,000 a year and your child care costs you $9,000 to $14,000 a year, it makes no economic sense for you to work. <laughs> Economically, pure economics. Wealthy folks, I think, although they'll end up paying more in their taxes if we li limited the, the deductions, the, uh, the credit to 28%, my guess is the vast majority will go along with it. They'll be happy with it. I really mean that. Because it will lead to greater economic growth and prosperity because we have a better educated public. Let me mention one thing which I know isn't directly on point here. I do believe it speaks, though, to the spirit that we need to regain in America. We've got to start to think big again. One of my frustrations is that um, listening to all the candidates is that uh, it is woe is me. Republicans who want to restore America that's on its knees. The Democrats are struggling with how we're going to make these changes. Ladies and gentlemen, I got elected when I was 29 years old. I am more optimistic today about the prospects for America than I ever have been in my whole life. We are so much better positioned than the rest of the world to be the leading economy for the remainder of this century than we have since the end of World War II. That's why when I announced I wasn't running, everybody said, why did I talk about a moonshot to end cancer? It's because we can. It's within our reach. We have the capacity to do that. And I believe we have to lay out for the American people some of the dreams that are within our reach to make them understand that the possibilities are immense for this country to lift them up, not falsely. When Kennedy announced the moonshot, it was more about generating more engineers and scientists and et cetera to lift the whole economy up. There's so many things we can do. We can light a fire under this country, but we gotta be more optimistic. I kid the president. When the president asked me to be his running mate, um, or actually, before that, when you asked me to be vetted, I said, no, I didn't want to be vice president. Uh, I could help him. I honestly believe I could help him better as foreign, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, and I didn't want to do it. He said, well, I need an answer right away. I said, well, I was on Amtrak at the time. I said, I said, Mr. President, that's easy. The answer is no. He said, well, how much time do you need? <laughs> I said, I don't need any time. He said, well, go home and talk it over with your family. So I went home, and I talked over with my family. And to my surprise, my family very much wanted me to do it. My wife, Walter, is classic. She said, Joe, I know you'd rather be Secretary of State, but it'd be better for the family if you were, you know. <laughs> and so I did the vetting process with 10 really bright men and women lawyers. They, it's like a colonoscopy. When, <laughs> When the president got my financial disclosure, I swear to God, I walked in to meet with him. He said, Joe, it's amazing. You own nothing. <laughs> um, I'm easy. You know, isn't that wonderful? I own nothing. But at any rate, the last question that the head of my team asked me before they left, and I'll conclude with this, was, uh, well, Mr. Chairman, uh, one last question. Why? Why do you uh, 
want to be vice president? I said, I don't. <laughs> no, he said, seriously, why do you want to be vice president? I said, seriously, I don't. I said, if the president wants me to do anything I can to help him to be vice president. And uh, so somehow that got back to my family. So my family thought I wasn't playing fair, that I was deliberately trying to sabotage what I said I would go ahead and do. And I wasn't. And my daughter, who runs the largest nonprofit in Delaware, um, uh, at uh, she, uh, the Center for Criminal Justice, placing people getting out of prison and jobs, et cetera. She came home for lunch, and this was in August. Everybody knew the decision was coming any, any time, and he had called me that day. He said, Daddy, he called, didn't he? Didn't he? And I said, he said, you said yes, didn't you, Daddy? I said, yeah, I told you. I crossed that a long time ago. I'm happy to do it. By the way, it's the best decision I ever made. I don't. And she said, Daddy, this is wonderful. She said, you know how you're always quoting Seamus Heaney in The Cure at Troy, where you talk about, you use the line, hope and history rhyme? She said, this is hope and history. I said, oh, he's hope, I'm history, huh? <laughs> Remember his running hope, you know? And so I kid with the president sometimes when things are down. I walk out of the oven and I say, Mr. President, don't make me hope. Because look, here's the deal, guys. A country is never more optimistic than their leaders. A country is never more optimistic than their leaders. And we need our leaders, and the president's one of them, who actually, actually, actually have a feel, a sense, and a taste for the enormous possibilities that we have. Your children aren't going to hear the word outsourcing. It's all about insourcing. People are coming home. A.T. Kearney does a survey every year, the 300 largest industrialists in the world. And they ask the question, where's the best place in the world to invest? By a margin larger than any time they've been keeping that, doing that survey in every category from IT to, to service to manufacturing, they say the United States. Folks, we have just such enormous possibility. If we just get out of our own way, believe a little bit more in ourselves, level this playing field, and invest so that we have the single best trained workforce in the world and the 21st, infrastructure, 21st century infrastructure. We do those two things. We own it. We own it for the next 50 years or more. Thank you all so very much.